The following episode is brought to you by the American Urological Association. This episode was made possible by support from Eurovant. Good evening, my name is Jay Raman and I'm Professor of Urology at Penn State Health and Chair of the AUA's Office of Education. It's my pleasure to host another podcast episode in our series titled Advancing Women in Urology. Today's specific podcast is on the topic of sponsorship, and it's really my pleasure to host two thought leaders uh, in this space, Dr. Peggy Pearl and Dr. Simone Favacilin. Uh, Dr. Pearl is Professor of Urology and Internal Medicine and Vice Chair of Academic Affairs in Urology at the UT Southwestern Medical Center, and she's also the President of the Endourological Society. Uh, Dr. Thabasilin is Associate Professor of Urology at Brown University. She's a Residency Program Director at Brown, as well as the Section Chief of the VA. She's a board member of the Society of Women in Urology, a recent board member of the Society of Academic Urology, and Vice Chair of our recent AUA Task Force on Diversity diversity and Inclusion. So uh, first of all, um, Peggy, Simone, uh, really appreciate you taking uh, some time, uh, as I said, on a Friday afternoon, evening, uh, to do this podcast with me. Really, our pleasure to host you. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Jay. Um, our hopes uh, from this show uh, with regards to objectives is is to really um, have the, the audience understand what is sponsorship, um, what the impact of sponsorship is on careers, um, finding a sponsor, and what makes a good sponsor, and um, finally, how to disrupt uh, bias and prioritize inclusion. So um, I guess as we go into this topic, I'll, I'll just maybe start off, and Simone, maybe, maybe I'll just uh, give you the, the sort of the first um, opportunity to sort of weigh in. Talk to us about what is, what is sponsorship, um, and, and can maybe distinguish it from some of the other terms that we have out there, namely uh, mentorship. What is it and, and how is it different? Sure. You know, sponsorship is the use of one's influence or leadership status to promote another colleague and advance them or connect them uh, or vouch for them uh, and connect them to opportunities, putting their name forward for high stakes assignments um, to get them noticed uh, or promoted. They protect and prepare and push colleagues all the way to the top. And in some sense, they're spending their political or social capital uh, on that person's behalf, sometimes behind closed doors, uh, in order to advance them and or promote them. And I think we're very familiar with the concept of mentorship, mentorship being, you know, a relationship that tends to be longitudinal, uh, where you might gather advice uh, on career advancement. And there is some um, overlap between sponsorship and mentorship. Uh, but I think sponsorship is rather different than mentorship, which is to say, while mentorship is really focused on career um, uh, development, sponsorship is focused on career advancement. Um, and while mentorship focuses on personal professional development, it typically is personally transformative and usually longitudinal in nature um, and rather critical in early career. Sponsorship, uh, on the other hand, tends to be more transactional in nature and certainly can feel transactional, uh, slightly more episodic, focused on very specific career advancement opportunities um, and very critical to mid and late career, uh, you know, uh, folks in their in their career trying to vault off that sticky floor of mid career and maybe go through that glass ceiling of a major leadership opportunity. And I might just add to that, that it can sometimes be confusing because uh, your mentor can also be your sponsor. In fact, that's probably very often the case, but it doesn't have to be that way. Your a mentor can be somebody at your level um, who just has experience that you may not have. Um, whereas a sponsor generally, uh, I think Simone, you pretty much stated that the, the, a sponsor is generally someone who's at a higher level in their career and has the influence that, that you don't. I think in addition, we think about that term of coaching. You think of a, a mentor is talking to you, a coach is talking with you, and a sponsor might be talking about you. Um, and thinking about the coaching uh, sphere, you know, you might be working with someone who's helping you work through a problem or developing your skill set, improving your self-belief, um, focusing on skills and tools 
uh, things like developing executive presence, um, working through developing uh, you know, plans for addressing conflict. Um, whereas a sponsor might have an engagement with you that is uh, much more directed and uh, less involved. So maybe a question for either of you, which is, um, and it's a really broad question to be honest, but um, how can we sponsor? So we, we now we understand in sort of this term of sponsorship, we've distinguished it from mentorship and, and coaching as well. Um, how, how can we sponsor uh, women or, or underrepresented minorities in, in our field of urology? I mean, I, I think Simone hit the nail on the head, really. It, it's about influence and it's using your influence. So in specific terms, um, you can invite someone to give a lecture at a meeting. You can um, suggest someone to have a position on a committee or, or better yet, you can recommend them to chair a committee. You can ask them to write an editorial comment. Um, you can ask them to be a plenary speaker or a moderator. Um, you can ask them, uh, you can nominate them for an award. Um, anything that you can do where you may have influence that can advance that person and it can take the form of, of anything in academic medicine um, that gives visibility, really. I completely agree. I think these are the metrics of academic promotion, those opportunities for national reputation. And I think if we're thinking outside of academic medicine and for those who are in practice, these are also opportunities to be involved in management responsibilities or directorships um, or roles you know, related to a CEO or CFO in your practice. And so uh, connecting to these opportunities, being uh, primed or trained or even groomed for these opportunities um, is the action a sponsor can take. Um, and occasionally a sponsor might have a plethora of these types of invitations that they can't fulfill. Um, and therefore, actively trying to share um, with someone else, maybe someone they know well or they don't know well, um, but they can't perhaps do everything on their plate. Uh, there's a key opportunity to have influence and share that opportunity and advance someone else. So I, I want to sort of use this and maybe talk a little bit now about um, career advancement, because I, I think I think you both highlighted that, you know, a critical element of sponsorship does sort of feed into and lead into this whole concept of career advancement. And so I'm going to ask you from two sort of different angles. So I'm going to ask you first, Peggy, uh, obviously um, uh, your accolades are numerous. Uh, you're full professor. You're obviously president of the Endourological Society, ABU board member. Maybe talk to us from, from your perspective as somebody who obviously has, you know, walked an amazing path. Talk to us a little bit about career advancement for you um, and maybe how sponsorship played a role. And then, and then Simone, I'm going to flip it over to you where you're at a slightly different portion of your career. And, and maybe I'd ask you that same question. So I would say, you know, sponsorship has been everything in my career. I, I, I would have to admit, I've never been one to sort of actively seek out opportunities. I, I read some of these articles and I'm, you know, the classic example of, you know, believing in the imposter syndrome and everything else. So I've benefited so much from people who have sponsored me and have put me forward um, when I might not have considered myself ready or worthy um, of those kind of positions. So at, at every step of my career, whether it was Ralph Clayman, you know, inviting me uh, to be a faculty member on a course shortly after I finished my fellowship, um, whether it was um, John McConnell, you know, inviting me as a guest to GU Surgeons, whether it was Klaus Rohrburn uh, putting me up for membership in GU Surgeons, um, whether it was Joe Segura who invited me to be faculty on an AUA urolithiasis course with the big boys in, in Stone Disease very early in my career. Um, those were opportunities that, that literally mapped my career development pathway um, that I would never have done on my own. I would never have been bold enough to do it on my own or to seek it out. Um, those, those people that I mentioned literally opened those doors and invited me in. 
and it was um you know transformative for me it, it made my career so simo now, now i'm going to turn it over to you so you're you're mid-career uh obviously uh program director at brown uh, you have leadership roles within the Brown system. Obviously, you have leadership roles uh, within urology, whether it be through SWU, the SAU, obviously the DEI task force. Maybe talk to us a little bit about um, your experience and and uh, you know, how it's maybe similar or or dissimilar from what Peggy's described. Yeah, I completely agree that I can look at the arc of my career and think about you know those people who tapped me on the shoulder and said, "Hey, I think you you should." think about doing this or consider yourself in this role in a way that I had never yet thought of myself being capable or ready for the role. Uh, they gave a little bit of confidence um, and then also open doors. So, you know, for me, for example, you know, my mentor locally is Anthony Caldemon. He was a program director before me and pediatric urologist. Um, and he started me down the path of being involved in surgical education. And then as things grew and I wanted to have a greater role in the Society of Academic Urology, he connected me to Byron Joyner, who then gave me my first opportunity to uh, participate in a talk in a panel at the SAU. Um, and that led to numerous other potential opportunities, because I think one of the key things folks looking for sponsors is when you get that first opportunity, you kind of go above and beyond and you kind of, you know, hit the ball out of the park, if you will, on whatever assignment big or small, the little bit of rotation, it creates a little bit um, of visibility. And then that leads you to your next potential opportunity. Um, I had started to write and uh, publish manuscripts on the topics. I knew this was a focus area of my career that I wanted to build over and above my clinical work. Um, and that led me to an opportunity to write an article with Tracy Downs, came the next sponsor in a major, um, you know, opportunity for me to co-lead the task force. So I see all of these folks uh, who are uh, as folks who truly impacted the direction. And then I take the responsibility of doing that myself. I think even as mid-career, you have the opportunity already from where you sit to influence those in early career. Um, or even peers um, with opportunities that I might be getting and looking to share or thinking really intensely about, well, let's say I'm about to write a paper and I look at the author group. Have I been intentional about making sure my author group um, is more diverse than it currently is? Um, and if not, then make an active uh, you know, move to improve that. And so I'm thankful for those folks who've opened those doors for me. Um, and I think of it as a very active method of inclusion to be doing it for others. That's great. I, I think you both summarized it so well and, and obviously uh, from, from slightly different points in, in your career, but a lot of very similar themes, uh, to be very honest. And and it's interesting. I, I, I want to use that as a, as a little bit of a, a touch point to go on to, you know, sort of the characteristics of a, a healthy, effective sponsorship. And it's really interesting from what you both were saying, what I really, I think one of the key takeaways, and it's funny, I looked at the podcast episode and it's, you know, advancing women in urology, but, but both of you, when you went through who your sponsors were, the key thing was it was not a gender aligned sponsorship. And, and I think that's one of the really critical elements in either direction, to be perfectly honest. I mean, Peggy, I would say, you know, you have been a sponsor for me, both back in the past and, and even now, as of just a few months ago. So, I mean, I, I think that that's one of the most critical elements. And just as both of you went through that, I really hope our audience understands that it is actually not gender aligned all the time. And I'm going to use that as a, as, a, as a jumping point to ask you both. Uh, either one in any order, talk to us a little bit about what are the characteristics of a sponsor? So from two perspectives, if you are looking for a sponsor, what should you be looking for? What are the characteristics of this person? Um, how do you find this person? That's probably a daunting task, to be perfectly honest. Um, so talk to me about that a little bit. I mean, I, I guess I would start with, you know, there has to be um, uh, accessibility, for one, I mean, a sponsor has to be somebody you know and someone you're exposed to. So it's it's unlikely to be a stranger. I mean, it, if you want someone to 
um, to really be promoting you and advocating for you, they need to know you. So they need to be in your sphere. And now you may actively put yourself in their sphere um, and that's fine. Um, you expose yourself to them and you um, hopefully make yourself indispensable to them or impress them or give them reason to see you. Um, the sponsor you know, needs to be somebody with influence. And it's back to, I think, you know, Simone's sort of definition of sponsorship. It has to be somebody with influence. So, you know, these are task specific um, to some degree. Um, as Simone said, they're sort of transactional relationships. So it may be for a specific task. You want to be on a, you know, editorial board or you want to be on, a, you know, a committee um, so it needs to be somebody in your sphere who has influence and who is willing to use that influence to promote you or advocate for you. So I think you need to make yourself seen. You need to make yourself visible and you need to look for somebody who's in a position where they can actually um, advocate for you. See, Mel, what, th let me ask you, I would you, add, you touched I think on this a little bit. Oh, sure. Go ahead. I would add, I think what you're looking for in a sponsor is three things. They have a seat at the decision-making table. They have some exposure to your work um, and they have power. That power is either social capital, political capital, decision-making ability, financial uh, decision-making. Um, and so I think that's how you recognize a sponsor. I think if you're looking to find a sponsor and you in fact don't have one, then you're left with kind of two options of that gaining performance currency, meaning you you generate this by delivering over and above what's asked of you or expected, kind of like the stock market. If a stock is doing well, people notice it. And so your visibility rises and you create reputation and you get paid or promoted potentially. That can attract a sponsor to you because folks want to be working with, with other for either kind of accomplishing and executing or um, kind of making progress in whatever their passion might be. And I think for those who aren't necessarily socialized to do this, you ha it requires you to show a little bit of your ambition uh, by taking on more challenging work, maybe even when you don't think you're quite ready for it, um, and maybe collaborate with people who you have not previously worked with. Um, but that makes you, you know, requires you to be a little bit visible and vocal. So, for example, at your sectional meeting, getting up to the microphone, asking questions, those little steps increase your visibility to get that kind of performance currency to attract a sponsor. I think the other way here is relationship currency, and that means you're generating, you know, this through the investment that you're taking your time and effort uh, with in terms of the relationships you have in your environment. Um, and as Peggy said, you can't ask for a sponsorship from a stranger; it just doesn't work. Um, but if you're taking your time to invest in the sphere that you're working in, in that orbit, um, people get to know you, and other people know other people. And so I think that's how you then make that that kind of connection, but it's definitely a deliberate act of developing your network. Um, and I think it kind of goes something like, listen, I'm interested in getting promoted, or I'm really interested in this professional society or this line of work or this area. And I've been doing a lot, um, you know, you know me, um, and I know I need someone to vouch for me behind, behind closed doors to kind of find that next opportunity. I, I think too, from the standpoint of the sponsor, it should be somebody who's at a point in their career where they have enough confidence in their own abilities and their accomplishments that they're willing to put themselves out there for somebody else. Um, you know, I personally get tremendous, you know, satisfaction and pride from seeing people that I have sponsored succeed. Jay, your case in point. Um, you know, you have to have somebody who is is confident in themselves and willing to um, to see somebody else advance. You know, there's room for everybody at the top, and um, you should look for somebody in a sponsor that that you know is not selfish. That they're willing to to bring others with them to ride their coattails um, and advance themselves. So Carla I'm ask Harris you the opposite. So I'm going to ask you about the opposite question now. You both have acted as sponsors. So what is your expectation as a sponsor? So we've talked about what you should look for in a sponsor, but if you are sponsoring someone, the corollary is to have a healthy relationship. What are your expectations of that person? And then Simone, sorry, I didn't mean to, to cut you off. Uh, yeah, no, not at all. I think, 
to 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 follow up on Peggy's thought there, I think Carla Harris, who's a, an executive in business, says that the best way to grow your power is to give it away. And I think this idea that you could shape someone else's career or have a protege um, is meaningful for people as they reach that more later career phase. Um, but there's a transition point there where there's some kind of tension of still wanting to hold on to opportunity but n and or letting go. Um, and I think the more secure you feel in your sense of accomplishment um, or the more priority you are placing on developing the next generation, the easier this, this task of sponsorship becomes. Um, and, and then, Jay, you mentioned what was your, the final question there? Well, what are the expectations of you as a sponsor for those that you're sponsoring? And, and you know, we've been talking about it a bit from one angle, which is what do you look for in a sponsor? But I'm sure as you both have sponsored persons, you have certain expectations of what's a healthy relationship and what sort of your expectations are when you are putting, I, I want to say maybe you're putting yourself out there for this person. Maybe talk if either of you or both of you could talk on that, on that uh, topic. Yeah, I think putting your reputation out on the line to let someone else take over a work project that might have been, in, uh, you know, offered to you uh, is a little bit of risk taking. And so I think what's key there is kind of setting an expectation and saying, hey, this was the opportunity. Uh, this is what I think would, it would take to be successful with this. This is what um, I think is necessary to accomplish this either invited speakership or this participation on a panel. Um, and so I think healthy discussion about what the expectation is. I think also, you, you know, that person has to be willing and wanting of this. It, it, it can't be that you're trying to push them into this role because you just want to get the work off your plate. It can't be that you're trying to push them into this role to create kind of your mini me, um, if you will. They, they're going to put their own spin on it. Um, I think the key is that you've had this discussion with them that they're going to rise to the task and, and, and give it that effort, however they might individually approach it. Um, I definitely think that it's weighing a little bit of a risk there, um, but that's part of the goal. Yeah, and Simone, I think, you know, what you're describing exactly is just trust. It's it, it's mutual trust in that relationship. Um, the sponsor is entrusting um, their reputation and, and um, word, you know, in promoting this person. If I recommend somebody, I, I really think this person, though young in their career, would do an excellent job giving a state-of-the-art lecture at, on the AUA plenary. So you are expecting that person to, to do their best. They need to stay on time. They need to be prepared. You know, you are trusting that they will be worthy of your, you know, your, your word. Um, and, and, and that goes both ways. So, but I, and I think as a sponsor, that's what you're looking for in somebody that you want to, to, you know, put your neck out for. So we talked maybe about five, seven minutes ago about um, career advancement. You know, you, both of you shared me a little bit about your own sort of <clears throat> career advancement. And, we, and that sort of led us on, on talking about sponsors and, and, and the types of sponsors and, and, and sort of the value of the sponsors. But I want to, I want to bring us back maybe to this whole concept of career advancement, particularly career advancement um, in women. And, and maybe if you could, either of you, talk to me a little bit about um, where are we with regard to career advancement for women in medicine broadly, and then in urology and or, or other surgical specialties? Maybe we're similar to that. Maybe we're different. Um, if you could talk to me about that. Yeah, you know, I think if we assess the status of women in medicine, there a, there's a lot of publication on this. And then, you know, tackling it with urology, many women urologists are actively publishing on these topics as well. I think academic medicine is no different than business, uh, than the government, than, you know, C-suites and boards uh, in Congress, where in general, women and certainly racial minorities are underrepresented at the highest levels of leadership, uh, be it chairs, deanships, if we're talking about academic medicine, or in practice as presidents, um, CEOs, CFOs, et cetera. Uh, I'm really struck by a recent paper by Samari showing the fact that there's been really no improvement in the path for women to full professorship in medicine over the last 35 years. Um, and I think that it, it, the lack of that gap closing um, is, is notable because just adding women to the mix without creating additional pathways for inclusion uh, is not going to be successful to advance them. And, and I think it's all reasonable to consider that 
both women and an underrepresented minority should be at the leadership decision-making table. I think ultimately for women in medicine, hours spent at clinical activity, um, accepting non-advancement career or citizenship burdens, um, conflicting work and life uh, priorities, imposter syndrome, marginalization, culture isolation, all influence, I think, the ability for women to advance into these um, highest leadership roles. Uh, it might affect women's perception of readiness um, or their willingness to accept stretch assignments. Um, and I think, you know, for women in urology, this is also pretty well documented in the literature. From early on, just medical students choosing a surgical subspecialty or urology, women tend to be socialized away from uh, surgery. And this ultimately limits the impact of women in urology and certainly in, in medicine. I, I think the career challenges women face across the spectrum for urology once, you know, during practice, many are pigeonholed into certain practice patterns. Uh, they face limited opportunities for speakerships or for um, more visible assignments. Their path to promotion is, is slower. Um, they're less likely to be recognized with major awards or recognition for uh, their work. And, you know, another obvious one is the gender pay gap, uh, where roughly 80 cents on the dollar um, for the value that they bring is, is probably not quite fair or just. Um, but this is also amid the backdrop of a rising number of women in urology. And so there's a great opportunity here to address some of these disparities, to ensure that the talent of women that's entering into the pipeline is really able to impact the field in the way that really has the potential to do so. That was really well said. Um, so, so I guess, you know, what I'd like to maybe spend the last five, 10 minutes on is, um, where do we go forward? What, what are, what are sort of our opportunities? So I think Simone, you laid out very well, um, you know, what the issue is. And, and I think you identified it very well, obviously in medicine, uh, in urology, and you're right, you know, the proportion that are coming into urology is higher. But as you said, if there isn't a conscious effort, it's just more persons, right? I, I mean, it's just more persons in the pool. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually achieving any type of meaningful goal if you look at leadership or, or opportunity. So what uh, what are our opportunities and and wh where do we go from here? And uh, Peggy, maybe I'll start with you and then and then go over to Simone. Sure. Well, I think I think, you know, as of the last you know, year or two, we are seeing it from the standpoint, I would say, of academic meetings. You know, everyone, every organization is making an effort to enrich their program with women and and underrepresented minorities. And, you know, having just completed it, you know, my term as secretary general of the Under Urological Society, you know, there's no question that in our planning or program planning meetings, that we're looking at that. We're actually looking at, are we you know, enriching our program with, with underrepresented minorities and women and, and make an effort to do so? There are plenty of qualified people out there to, to fill these roles, and it's just a matter of giving them an opportunity. Now, sometimes it can go a little far in the other direction where the, the few women in the field are being stretched to you know, be a part of every program everywhere, and that gets a, a little difficult. But but we're definitely seeing that and we're making an effort. We're looking at, OK, here are the committees we have in our society. Wow, this committee has no women on it. We need to to, you know, correct that. And so it's, you know, it's clearly much more in the forefront of our minds now. And so people are making a real effort to identify those people, to look hard and to find qualified people that can fill those roles. And that's something that we weren't doing before. You know, it's it was just who are the visible people out there and let's let's put them on the planning program or put them on the on the program. But but now we're really making an effort to see that there is representation and that's a great first step. I would add that we're, we're talking about sponsorship uh, mostly as an individual career advancing endeavor here. Um, but when we think of it as a global responsibility for senior leaders or anyone in a leadership role of a professional society or a practice, then it becomes an institutional or structural strategy for advancement. And I think that approach um, allows us to create pathways of inclusion. Um, I think there's there's no lack of talent for women or, or URM in urology, but there is a problem of network selectivity 
and resource allocation. And so if we're thinking about opening our networks intentionally, that means inviting someone who you might not know well, who maybe doesn't look like you or didn't have the same path to urology uh, as you did, but intentionally and actively inviting them on to your committee or your panel um, in, in order to, to increase those opportunities. I think also the reality is the vast majority of urology leadership is male. And so I think as we reach our audience who is largely male, we have to think about the fact that sex and race concordant mentorship or sponsorship is effective. And I think uh, Dr. Ganey Simmons has just published on this, particularly for URM entering urology, that having a race specific mentor is very useful. Um, but when we think about discordance that you brought up, Jay, I think it's very powerful to have a not race or, or gender discordant mentor or sponsor, um, because that opens you up to the opportunity for additional kind of organizational clout that you otherwise would not have been associated with or exposed to. And I think uh, that's where there's really a key opportunity for the, the men in urology to be extraordinarily effective at advancing gender equity and racial equity. Um, and I see the need to, at the level of leadership, really frame this as inclusive leadership, that what excellent leadership looks like is gender or racial equity. Um, and I think that involves sharing and using your privilege and your position uh, to unleash the talent of, of other folks. Um, and I, I ultimately think urology is very well positioned to do that. We're a very collaborative group of folks in general. You know, the way we approach surgical problems um, and innovation, I, I think we're very well poised to, to be very unique in the surgical subspecialties in that setting. That was really well said. Um, so uh, let me let me ask you both uh, as we sort of come to the end of, of this uh, 30, 35 minutes or so. Um, any any final thoughts from either of you? Maybe I'll start with you, Peggy, first and then maybe over to Simone. A any final thoughts or, or maybe something that I I haven't asked you or I haven't covered in the, in the setting of this uh, uh, podcast today? Um, well, I, I would just say that I, I do feel an optimism. Um, I think you know, people like Simone who are really out there promoting the problem and the solution, um, making us aware when we were never really aware before, and I'm as guilty of it as anybody. Um, I think it's been really important to just have the conversation. And I think we're seeing the results of that conversation, you know, at every meeting and we're beginning to see it more and more in leadership roles. You know, institutionally, that almost seems a little slower to me, but but certainly from the level of our our organizations, I think that we're we are seeing the you know the fruits of what people like Simone are doing. And um and it's and it's changing before our eyes. And that's gratifying. I mean we have a long way to go and it, it's still hard to, you know, people have to still channel through the pipeline. It's you you can't get away from that to some degree, but we're seeing it. And, and as she said, there are just plenty of qualified people out there. And it's just bringing them to the forefront. And, and as those people get into leadership positions, um, it will be perpetuated at an even faster rate. I would add that I think we all are, are primed to work hard um, and, and, and be industrious um, and kind of assertive. Um, but I think as we all know, it's not just what you do, it's also who you know. And Capitalizing on the relationships of a potential sponsor um, is a, a key important way uh, to advance yourself. Um, and I think sponsorship can unleash the talent of female and male urologists um, that's building up in the pipeline and, and unlock those closed doors of advancement where talent is insufficient, but who you know behind closed doors does really matter. Um, and I think this is very critical for urologists who experience the compounding marginalization of intersectionality from the interplay of other identities, you know, apart from gender and race specifically, but sexual orientation, ability, economic status. I think that those additional social identities that influence uh, the trajectory of your career over and above, again, talent and work effort, um, we have to recognize that, that that's at play. Um, and I think we're called as leaders then to ask ourselves, what can we do to help both at an individual and structural level? We kind of all own the culture, the, the structures, the policies, the norms that we work with within urology. And so 
I, I think that we have a very talented group of leadership who's willing to kind of think outside the box. I'm appreciative of the AUA even having this conversation to begin with, to, to decide to do a topic on sponsorship and, and specifically for women. Although again, I hope we're reaching male audiences just as just the same. Um, because I think those of us who are in leadership and those who aspire to be in leadership should recognize that developing the skills of inclus inclusion are going to be critical for advancement. No, it's really outstanding. Well, I really, first of all, want to thank both of you, uh, Simone, Peggy, uh, really uh, eloquently stated, and uh, I think um, really, I think hitting on a really uh, essential point, and I think, Simone, you hit it on the head, which is my hope is that this podcast is not sort of um, listened to by one specific gender or, you know, race, or, I mean, but, but the message is really ubiquitous. And um, and sure, it, it happens to fall into the series of advancing women in urology, and I think it's it's critical there. But I think so many of the themes that you talked about, whether we talk about gender, race, ethnicity, um, it, it's it's applicable. And and I really want to thank both of you so much for uh, your time uh, this evening and your thoughtfulness. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, Jay. This has been a thrill uh, for our audience. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, for more information, please visit us at auanet.org slash university, where we have housed a number of different references for any of you that are interested in taking a deeper dive into some of the concepts and ideas that we talked about this evening. Uh, Simone, Peggy, I hope you both have a very happy and safe holiday with your families. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in person, hopefully sometime soon. Thank you. And to both of you, too. Take care.